Hello, everyone. Welcome to Product School's webinar on data-driven product strategy. I'm your speaker for today, Talon Mendonca. Uh, before we begin, a little about me in short. So I'm Talon. I work in my, uh, at Microsoft on Azure. In specific, I am the owner for Network Insights, which is a network monitoring tool, and part of the general network monitoring solutions that uh, are available in Azure. Since most of you might not be familiar with uh, you know, the, the terminology in a cloud, let me give you an analogy. The tools that my team builds are like uh, the tools that your phone company gives you, like who are you speaking to, your call logs, your bills. So, uh, they tell you, you know, they similarly we build tools for monitoring network traffic in the cloud, seeing which, you know, what are the networks that are speaking to each other, what are the devices that are uh, consuming the most amount of bandwidth and so on and so forth. So we do similar things to what your phone company does, except for servers in the cloud. Uh, a little bit of my prior history. So I've been in, in the tech industry throughout my career. Uh, I started off as a data analyst uh, on the anti-spam team at Facebook. And you know, I was among, on the team that fought those pesky Zynga games, if anyone remembers. And I was on the Facebook platform team. From then on, I was fascinated by product and transitioned into product management. I had uh, been fortunate to work at some very interesting firms like Microsoft now, Facebook earlier, Paytm and Instamojo, which are two prominent startups in the uh, payments industry in India. Overall, I've, I've had th six years of work in the product, in product management and learned a lot of fun lessons along the way. Outside of work, uh, I call myself a geek with some redeeming qualities. So I love reading books. Uh, I'm into running and meditation. I'm an occasional blogger and stand-up comic. So that's me in short. All right, so let's get down to business. So what do I mean when we say data-driven product strategy? What is today's uh, talk about? So by product strategy, I, I simply mean the core task of a product manager, which is to come up with a roadmap. Now, why do I, why am I speaking about roadmapping? I believe that roadmapping is essentially the strongest tool you have to shape the destiny of your firm, that it's where your all the theoretical insights, your understanding of your competition, et cetera, comes together, defines a plan for a company to execute. And if you've done a roadmap well, and, you, and you're assuming your execution can follow through, you actually can you know set up your company for success. It's and one of the uh, most underused tools in uh, road mapping I feel, is data. Too, too many of us uh, just go with what the CEO says, what the, what the competition is doing, or you know what we see around us, rather than blending and bringing in a good example of okay analysis, data, gut, all of these to come together and create you know a cohesive sort of roadmap. So this talk is not just a generic session on road mapping. It's, we're going to do a specific case study. Uh, it's, I'm not going to cover any frameworks. In fact, I'm just going to go through an example of what I did in my previous firm. Uh, a little bit of the context here, but the firm, the example I'm going to take, or the case study we're going to do is from my time at Instamojo. Instamojo is a, is a startup in the payment space in India. It's an e-commerce product. Uh, it's an e-commerce product that has, you know, that is targeted at SMBs and then we're going to cover its journey and some of the road mapping work that I did there. So for our agenda for today is that I'm going to give you some company context, how it looked, how the problem looked when I joined. Uh, I'll walk you through some of the analysis I did and some of the discoveries that I made, some of the counterintuitive. How did I go through about, you know, given these uh, changes and given these you know, discoveries, what did I change? How did I design a new product and roadmap? How do I execute the change? And finally, a summary of, you know, what you can take away from this talk. Okay, so what is Instamojo and what did it do? So Instamojo started out as a product to sell digital goods. What do I mean by digital goods? So let me tell you, explain it with a story. So the founder was running a newsletter in India and he wanted, he eventually got a good following, had a lot of subscribers and he wanted to monetize it. But he realized there's no easy way to monetize it. Uh, this is seven years ago when there was no sub stack and there was no tiny letter or review. It was a very nat very nascent ecosystem when newsletter boom has come down. But he, re but he realized that, okay, he was onto something and you know, a lot of people are willing to pay for it. So as you can see on the screenshot here, it was like upload, share, sell, or give away. It was designed as a tool for monetization of digital products. But from there, with a few changes, it evolved into a sort of lightweight e-commerce tools. So over time, it, it added it into a, it added other categories like events, physical goods, and a generic category called others, where you could just pretty much sell anything. And it went from just designed for digital creators to a tool for small and business, small and medium businesses in general. Now, even though there were four categories, essentially you could say it had one core feature, which was payment pages, where you could, you know, uh, add a photo, add a description, create a listing page, like an e-commerce page, and that page was automatically your checkout. Someone, you could share that link with someone, uh, page link with someone, they could come there, pay you, and, you know, you could make your sale. So it enabled small businesses to go online and start selling stuff. So this was Instamojo's context. It was a very lightweight e-commerce tool to, uh, to start with. 
now when when i joined instant mojo it was a, it was just after they had uh, raised a series a it's uh, raised a series a and i was the second product manager on the team and i wanted to understand what is up what is going on in this space i was relatively new to it and uh, you know wanted to get a grounded understanding so over the course of many months i did a couple of things to deepen my understanding so the first thing i, I did as you can see on the top left is that i tried to become a power user of the product i went and played up around with every nook and cranny of the product created every type of thing tried to sell tried to do the checkout flows uh, tried to sell some files tried to upload physical goods play around with images play around with the variants that we have and you know, essentially test qa the hell out of the product uh, the next thing that i did was you know bring in my data angle and analyze the product both quantitatively and qualitatively now what are these two different things now in terms of qualitative i i did a simple act of one looking uh, you know looking up our customers we had some customer data they were registered with us we had their phone numbers and emails just reached out to them had conversations with them ran user interviews with them some informal some just casually try to understand okay what are they selling how do they run their businesses how does this fit into their lives uh, you know are we the only tool they use what else do they what do they struggle with etc this was in depth conversation we ran a lot of these to under i ran, i found it you know this is a golden opportunity we in fact had a user researcher on the team also who assisted me with this and it really gave me a good picture about okay where does this fit into you know into their lives and how does it work the second thing i had to do was come at it from the quantitative angle this was this was easy to me in my previous jobs where like at a facebook i had a ready made you know data infrastructure but over here it a lot of effort went into setting it up i had to request my engineers to give me a you know a read replica of the database so i could run some queries uh, there were no event tagging there was hardly any dashboards in place uh, fortunately we got a data analyst to come on board and you know we could sort some of this out and we could start developing a more refined quantitative analysis of what our customers did and you know how they behaved what categories they lied in what are our volumes what are the patterns of transactions and data that we have on board a last thing that i looked at was the competition and market so payments as a space has remarkably improved in the last 7 uh, to 8 years especially with the maturing of internet payments uh, 10 years ago not only in india but even worldwide i think it was internet payments was much gradually much smaller uh, but now you're seeing even in even china is a leader in terms of mobile payments they had to a trillion dollars worth of payments through mobile wallets india has started to catch up with like you know billions of dollars passing through india's upi system but all of this was not there then it was a relatively fresh emerging space uh some of the things i looked at so i looked at both the e-commerce and payments players in india and across the world so that stripe and square from the e-commerce from the payments angle these were the, these were the leading startups back then shopify from uh, you know the, as an e-commerce player tried to understand okay how does that work with payments and finally i looked at paytm free charge and some of the other wallet players in india so these were similar to the ali pays and uh, you know and wechat wallets in india so you know look at the uh, competition as a whole you know what is everybody doing uh, what are they up to and how are they thinking about this market so together like it became a power is the product did some quantitative analysis or some qualitative analysis had to set things up and also took an overview of the market so this gave me a multi sided picture of what is happening i this is not something i sat and you know stopped work and did but it was something that was an ongoing basis because i was new to the space and i was new to the company it's something i was continuously investing it uh, and investing in learning and you know getting up to speed on the product and on the space now based on this analysis i came to I found out a lot of things some were uh, understandable some were very intuitive and surprising to me now what were these things so now let's go with the uh, you know quantitative analysis we looked at the transaction distribution you know what type of sellers when do the payments occur and so on and so forth the first thing we found sort of fits in with logic was that it was very pareto in terms of volumes now what do i mean by pareto it's that the the pareto distribution is like you know uh, a small fraction of the users drive a majority of the volume we found it to be true almost pareto like you know the top 20% of the users were driving 80% of our volumes uh, under the interesting insight we found was that volume and mva i mean you drivers are different so if you analyze the number of transactions in terms of volume you could you know handfuls of sellers drove drove the volumes but we had a very long tail in terms of smbs which were irregular not consistent uh, but you know they have made the bulk of our mau so very different you can see very different pictures when you analyze the same data in terms of okay who's driving your volumes in terms of total amount of uh, in, in the term of total you know amount of payments versus the total number of transactions that are being doing which is being led by the long tail now one interesting thing we found was that uh, even though we did not have a proper api product we had a uh, we had a way to embed buttons into you know customers 
e-commerce solution so if you're using an uh, if you're using your own shopify or other e-commerce solution you could put in an insta module link and uh, effectively you got a ready made api uh, so now what we found that majority of our large volume customers were using us in that api ish format they were adding links to their checkout and then customers would be redirected to our page do the checkout and go back versus majority of the small businesses were using us like payment links they would send these links in chat or other interfaces uh, and you know it was there was not a programmatic integration it was all manual and most of our larger customers or prominent customers had their own website so it was that was very different from our expectation where we assumed that freelancers are sending links by themselves over there to sell stuff so that was one of the early surprises now let's talk about types of users now uh, for typical audience we realized and this was not out of our expect not too far away from our expectation was that it was a non tech savvy small business it was your freelancer your uh, your seller your the coaching class teacher or you know educator or you know someone so providing education or it's uh, online any of those categories uh, they were small business they formed the bulk of our distribution now when we look look at their pages looked at you know so it's some of had the ability to set up these what i mentioned the e-commerce style listing pages when i went and looked at their pages most of the pages were blank like they had not filled in too many pictures or too many details we did have customers who had filled in some details but a lot of them were uh, you know not they completely blank they just had a simple title or a one two line description so this 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 was an insight for us or at least for me so i realized that we were not the primary customer facing interface for the for the seller they already had something or they were consult, uh, you know consulting with their customers on chat or they had their own website and we were the secondary interface where the customers would be redirected just for checkout so there was no, not too much of description or not too much of an ornament ornamentation for uh in fact that was done somewhere else whether it's in a set of photos you send on whatsapp as a you know as a hospitality service or in your own website where you're selling ebooks that was where customers would do their selling and they would only send it to our website or to our checkout to our website for checkout uh however there was one anti pattern which was some of our e-commerce customers larger ones were using us as an api where they had full blown e-commerce solution integrated and they would just at the last moment during checkout they was in, they would redirect to us so two sort of patterns there but the bulk of it was this uh smbs who were not uh, who were you know who were running their own store but sending manual links now the one final lesson for us over there was biggest takeaway for me was our sense perception versus our reality now there is a big difference between what we thought we did versus what we actually did now we thought as i mentioned that uh, as i called out earlier we thought we were an e-commerce company that you know we are allowing people to sell stuff online you know we are their face for the we have the face for their business they will list their products here they will put in a good description on their listing page they will have a good uh, image and we will drive sales for them. turns out that they had their own channels uh, we were merely a checkout for them so our sales perception was that we were an e-commerce company with a payments with payments as a feature our reality was that we were a payments company with e-commerce as a feature and the e-commerce feature was also wasn't also very strong so this was definitely an initial sort of shocker for us that it it flipped our narrative around that okay if you are a payments company then you think very different about the, you know the features you're building what you want to integrate with etc versus if you're an e-commerce company where you would think of okay let me add a cart uh, let me you know let me add better checkouts let me add no pin codes and so on and so forth very so e-commerce payments are very distinct roadmaps they're part of an overall e-commerce problem but uh definitely two sides are different and meaty problems in themselves so for us we realized that okay uh we are sort of in the e-commerce business but uh the reality we think we are in the e-commerce business but the reality is that we are in the payments business so that was one of the biggest narrative shifts for us now as you may have realized this was a big shock especially for me on the product team and for others in the design team and so on for you know, all of us the builders in the product that the framing of our product had gone completely 180 degrees uh we're switching now e-commerce itself is a huge category with products uh, like shopify big commerce and a bunch of tools over there even woocommerce wordpress themes are used to sell e-commerce and payments itself is a different category altogether and we were sort of changing categories here we were changing our lens and perspective so it was a big shift in terms of what we would do and you know how we would think think about things now uh, is, how do you go about doing this and you have to you know massage this change in very carefully so initial my initial conversations were all with the design team like i was validating data listening to what they had heard from i was relatively new to the team and the rest of the teams on the folks on the product team were much older they had experience not older in terms of, they were older in terms of experience they had been here for a while i was a new product manager there and uh, i was validating some of my assumptions and my understandings with them and i what i why saw resonated they were like yeah actually we've seen this the use cases more around payments it's not so much around e-commerce 
uh, the four use cases are almost interchangeable. We've not gone into depth in them. Uh, larger run payment. So it, I did hear a lot of resonance, and I was con- able to convince at least my product team much more easily, uh, and you know, bring them on board and suggest, okay, we should pursue a payments related direction, not so much an e-commerce. Uh, this was followed by a much more difficult conversation with the CEO, who was not convinced that okay, that whether this was the right thing, such a sort of pivot and strategy would make sense or not. Uh, and for me over there, I was essentially my approach there was to continue hammering a conversation with logic and data, but also trying to frame the conversation differently. So it took a lot of uh, back and forth, you know, to convince the CEO and uh, other other upper management about this particular change. Now that required framing the problem better over time. And that only came, I did not actually, was not able to frame it well initially, but over time I was able to get to what I was trying to say and, you know, articulate it much better. So what did I end up saying? So for me, I articulated our change in, in terms of verbs. So earlier we were thinking of uh, our product as enabling just selling, you know, like e-commerce is sell, the verb that you use is sell. But I realized that actually there were three different uh, hidden use cases for us. It was sell, collect and integrate. Sell is like the standard e-commerce use case. You put a listing and, you know, someone comes there, checks out the product, buys it. Collect is the more uh, payments link orient, payment link oriented uh, uh, process where Either you request payments like the examples would be Venmo in the US or it could be like, you know, WhatsApp, Pay, UPI, et cetera, in India, where essentially you're, you know, you're doing a P2P transaction, you're, you know, you're collecting payments from someone just digitally. So that's a collect use case. And finally, there's the integrate use case, which is completely API driven. This is the domain of Stripe or Razorpay in India, where essentially you have a developer who comes in and does an integration and uh, you're, you have an integrated payment system, which is part of a larger e-commerce experience. So, you know, different, uh, different, different forms essentially of, you know, sub parts of the problem. So we were okay at sell. We were best at collect and we were not, we hardly had a presence in integrate. So even though a lot of our customers wanted us to integrate, we did not have a clear product over there. So we essentially had only one product called payment pages. So this sort of, uh, this sort of framing had, you know, structure the story better. Okay. There's three different use cases and we are good at one and, but our customers are trying to do diff- multiple different things with us. Then I had to articulate how would this turn, translate into product strategy. Now it meant, okay, if you're talking about selling, we would need to have a full blown e-commerce solution. We have to build a store, a cart, a checkout, pin code builders, so on and so forth, pin code checkers, so on and so forth. And all the, uh, you know, all the bells and whistles that you have on any e-commerce platform, because e-commerce platforms are much more mature in terms of the customer, you know, how people relate to them and people have experience using them. Uh, compared to that, the payment links of the checkouts experience, it was something that was an emerging use case. It's not very popular, but it was a good use case for us to bet on because this was an emerging, this was a behavior that was relatively new. Finally, the API use case, the integrate use case, it was uh, relatively mature in foreign markets and it was coming to India as digital payments grew, but the solutions were known over there. There was not, there was not so much new happening in terms of how it was a standard. You embed something uh, on your website, you click through a redirect or a JavaScript pop-up happens and your payment is done. So we felt that okay, we felt that that is not a sweet spot for, for us to attack. So how did we sort of you know translate this into a roadmap? So now that we had three different use cases, I was able to convince us here, okay, that you know this is sort of how we should frame our problem. It's self collect, integrate, you know, store, checkout, API, and you know what should we go after? Now based on our own understanding of what our use use cases were, how the market is going, uh, what our capital, you know, what our capitalization is. We decided to most aggressively go after the collect use case, which is, you know, an SMB or a freelancer, uh, sending links on their, you know, send, having sending links of their store or of the, of a, you know, custom link that they've created to their customers and, you know, requesting payments. Uh, because we felt that this is where, you know, this is the most untapped market for us and where we have the strongest strength, you know, the, the biggest strength. However, we also decided to launch some products in every category so that we don't lose customers. So we also realized that, okay, a lot of small businesses which started us, uh, over time, they would grow and they would, go, uh, you know, graduate to a large payment gateway who, you know, which was completely API driven, et cetera. We realized that, okay, we can never be a complete uh, payment gateway solution. And only thing we had to stop was to increase the retention period for those customers. So that was sort of the goal which we came with. We felt that, okay, that we, we don't want to be a payment gateway. That market has extremely low margins and we don't want to be an also rank player in that space. Uh, you know, that we felt okay that not a strategic strong point and our, our strength was sort of in the design for SMBs and you know much more long tail market that we go, could go after. So we decided to launch products in every category, but for you know just to sort of increase our retention period, make sure that customers come and you know, they get some sort of hope. But our core focus would be on the collect use case for small businesses. 
uh, and we had a conscious call to not go into the payment gateway market and stick to SMBs. Uh, one of the reasons also was that it was a relatively less capital intensive business, and we felt that okay, that at that point at least was not our strong suit in terms of uh, both you know setting up our own payment gateway business and you know, fighting other players in the market. So that's how we sort of translated that initial insight into okay into sort of a new conceptualization of our product itself and into finally a roadmap. Okay, now since we have these three categories. We're going to pick this specific specific category and go after it, given all our context, given our given the market, given our own capitalization. So that's how we converted those insights into a roadmap. So what did we do? So let me talk about three specific launches that I did that you know sort of shaped our business going forward, and they sort of fit very well into our three different sell collect integrate categories. Now, if you recollect, I told you how we found that our distribution was very Pareto. Uh, a small volume of customers, small amount of customers, were driving the majority of our volumes, and these customers were all sort of like uh, e-commerce customers who had their own websites and were using us just for checkout. Now, what we decided to do was to address this market properly and you know reduce uh, the amount of churn that we would see in this segment. To do that, what we did was we created a, a very good API, API payments API product. Earlier, we had a sort of hacky integration where customers would redirect to us, etc. We decided to go all out, benchmark against the best in the world, and create uh, create a good, at least formidable checkout experience. Now, this once this was launched, and we were able to put out a you know a strong API out there, mixed with uh, you know put the word out in the market, and customers started using it. We saw very good adoption. Our transactions skyrocketed. In fact. Uh, in the time that I was there, it went API would API represent a, a large fraction, but it uh, but overall thanks to the new API, our volumes doubled. Uh, the API transactions that I mentioned, there you know the biggest customers are the ones who use API, and our volumes effectively doubled. It was started to dominate our business, even though it was amongst the newest launches. The story completely changed, and we were able to go after a much different set of customers and stem you know stem the tide of churn. So customers who would have churned out at much smaller volumes and gone to a different payment gateway now hung around with us for longer. So we could handle a much more larger life, you know, part of the customer life cycle. The second thing we did was create what we call payment links. As you mentioned, one of our products was this was the e-commerce style listing page where you would come in and there image, description, a lot more, and you would get an e-commerce sort of checkout, and that would be a listing page. We uh, we realized that okay, on looking at the customers from both from data and you know just qualitative checks. There's a lot of customers are using us just to get you know a small amount paid. They're not using us as a storefront. So we did a radical simplification of our e-commerce listings uh, product, and we created what we what we call payment links, where you have to just enter the amount and the purpose. If you wanted hundred bucks, uh, you know whatever. If you wanted say twenty thousand bucks for a workshop you conducted, just okay, say enter twenty thousand, enter workshop, and you get a neat little link that you would send out. Now with this link. Uh, this this reduced the number of steps you had required from you know to collect a payment like manifold the experience became much more uh, streamlined and smooth, and uh, and this product was launched. So assuming that you know based on was the launch based on the insights that we had seen, we have seen that our customers are already leaving those features blank or they're filling in some nonsense values. They're not really use, using the features of our product. So this was a uh, reduction in, the, in in what we offered, but it made it more precise and appropriate to the use case. And we saw that, and we retained the old use case. So customers still could still go and create full, uh, you know, full high description e-commerce listings, or they could create payment links. And we found that within a few months of launch, 60% of users were creating payment links. So they had, they were no more doing e-commerce, they were no more doing listings, and they found a much more healthier, a much more appropriate sort of channel by creating payment links. So that was, you know, product launch number two. Where through payment links we were a, uh, able to radically simplify the experience and make it you know make it fitting to our customers' use case. Now the third was a storefront. So now we re, uh, now we uh, initially we thought we are just an e-commerce product and we sort of made some forays here. We attempted uh, to to continue to retain some of our e-commerce products with uh, e-commerce customers. So we added the ability to, earlier we had only a single product checkout. You could only buy one thing at a time. So we added a cart. We added sort of listing page improvements. But we realized that okay, the delta between our solution and a proper, you know, e-commerce solution, be it a WooCommerce or a Shopify or whatever is out there, there's tons of bells and whistles. We be able to check a PIN code, variants, uh, offers, so on and so forth. The delta was very huge. Uh, making a full-blown e-commerce product itself would have been a two-year roadmap independently. So over there, we tried small fixes to, uh, you know, stem the gap. But we realized okay, this is one area where we fall short very badly. Where you know our it's, our SMBs are something don't, that don't need this very badly out of the gate, and uh, our product is falling very short. 
So we sort of made one two attempts here and to, to stem the tide, but we were not able to make strong progress. And the gap also was very huge. Eventually, after I left, uh, Instamojo acquired a store builder firm. They acquired this company called Get Me a Shop, and that sort of plugged the gap between you know. And now they had a now they have a full blown e-commerce solution integrated over there. So very sensibly, in terms of either if you the raise capital, hire a team, and you know build this by yourself, or you can save time by white labeling or acquire a company. They decided to go with the you know acquisition route. So that's how over time this sort of shaped our strategy. We were able to launch an API and extend the lifetime of our businesses, small businesses who are out and grow big. We were able to create payment menus that were much more appropriate to our use case, much more simpler to create in high end PS. And over time, we invested in our storefront and uh, create you know create a much more stronger offering for the e-commerce business. So yeah, that's how I was, I was able to sort of take that one insight of the fact that we are uh, not an e-commerce company, that our customers are not uh, using us as we think we do, and convert that into a roadmap, into a multi-year roadmap relationship over three years, and sort of you know generate hundreds of millions of uh, dollars in sort of payment volumes and revenue. Uh, so what's the conclusion here? You know, what should you go take back? So first lessons I would say is like you know what I did initially was that you should get your hands dirty with the product. I could get these insights. Only because I spent time talking to customers, playing around, seeing how it worked, looking at from the customer's lens, uh, and you know, intuitively de- developing an intuitive sense of you know what people are doing with this product. So it's e- much easier to do for uh, say B two C products where a lot of people the, the expected user base, the use cases are simpler, the user base is very generic, uh, harder to do. But I think nonetheless you should definitely try it and you know try to become the power user of own product. And I was able to do that. Second thing I would say is observe your users. Now, you will always make some assumption when you use it, you think so you, it's very important to go and do a qualitative sort of dipstick and talk to customers, observe them in their uses, observe their lifestyle and see where you fit in. It's not just important to know why they use you, but what is the context in which they use you? How much they care, what do they actually care about? Like one thing we realized was that, okay, for a lot of small businesses, a problem that we cannot solve and that is much more fundamental to them is the fact that they need more customers. This is a big problem for SMBs and we didn't have a magic solution for this, but we realized, okay, uh, marketing solutions are something you know that they're desperately care. And over time, we were able to build a platform and also do some marketing integrations, which helped businesses recover, old, you know, lost leads and things like that. But that insight remained with us. So you want you want to really know what is the importance of you your you your product and your problem in the overall context of your customer. The third takeaway I would recommend is use data. Now I was able to go and do a qualitative and quantitative analysis that really told me okay that gave me those two lenses of okay what is our volume driver what is our MAU driver. Uh, you know, what sort of customers are using what sort of product. And it, this, it's always good to develop a gut, but it's much more important to validate that gut and refine that gut with data. Data is the truth. You know, not your gut. You can tell yourself any stories, but you need someone, you need someone or something to go and, you know, see, is this the truth that I'm assumption or is this, the, or you can always create false narratives in your head or a narrative that holds it doesn't hold up to reality. So it's important to go and use data. The next thing I would say is tell a story. Now, this is a this is I will I'll cover this in the mistake section too. But it's important not just sit with data, but use that data to you know blend it with narrative and blend it with their understanding to tell a story. People don't buy data. If I just tell you, okay, fifty percent of seventy percent of customers are using this in a checkout fashion, that doesn't sound uh, like a like a compelling story. What you'd rather want to say is that most customers want to set up a full blown e-commerce product. They come to us just for the payments part, but they are much more proud of the identity and what they can do on the e-store. They can decorate it, etc. That's why we we don't figure out figure in as much as we want to. So that story tells you know what the customer does, what do they want, what is their overall desire, and then it tells you why you fit in. It makes for a much more coherent narrative. So you want to tell a story and then sell the story. Now in this case, we were driving a big change. Like you know, we had to drive a sort of change in company strategy based on what we understood. Uh, it's important to sell the story, debate internally. Uh, it's good to have, good to have or encourage a, good, a product culture, debate with your other employees, see what they think about it, and eventually use that story to drive a strategy and roadmap. So once we understood, once I was able to articulate, okay, our three verbs are sell, collect, integrate, we are going to focus on collect, that's our strength. Uh, we're going to other places, we're going to just try to stem the tide and not hemorrhage customers, you know, reduce the churn, but our strength and focus will be on the collect use case. That story was able to, you know, I could translate it in, into, you know, a lot of places and, you know, hammer it into people's heads of, you know, that this is what you're going to do and create a strategy from that. Now, I'll just talk about in brief words some of the mistakes I made. Uh, I went and pushed only data without narrative. For me, I, I felt like, you know, that, that since I'd done the data, I'd done a good analysis and, you know, I had just, you know, I had the facts in front of me. That's all I had to present. But I realized that, okay, this was a big change. Just, you know, someone's, uh, 
change is very difficult in general. And especially if you're working with founders or other folks who have worked on a problem for many, many years, uh, it's important to sell the change gently. You can't just push it hard. I try to push the change hard, but I think it would have been much more uh, smarter for me to, you know, have lots of small, small discussions into instead of one big discussion and massage the idea in, like, you know, present one data point, present another data point at some point before trying to, you know, present a big bang solution. So it, it's sort of the idea of warming up someone to the idea before you sort of make a big ask. And that's something where I felt I could have done, you know, much better. Where I essentially went in with data and thought and, you know, tried to push my narrative, you know, push my story ahead. But I think I would have done a much better job, uh, you know, had I warmed them up to the change over time. This is something I do now. Now I'm in a much more complex org. I'm in, in Microsoft, which is, which is the firm with, uh, 100,000 plus employees with a complex sort of, uh, stakeholder structure. And now, organically i sort of understand okay you know it takes time for people's opinions and perceptions to change i have to you know work with this to massage it into people's ideas over time to keep communicating things before the you know ideas are delivered and people really understand it that's something i've learned over time so yeah uh hope you enjoyed this talk and hope you found it interesting how we went from you know uh you know went from some from weird insights we found how we used it to reframe our own story and eventually launched a product and made the company more successful so if, yeah, I loved uh, sharing these insights and the story. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm available on Twitter, dalimantonka, dalimantonka.com. Uh, yeah, you can find my name, admin, LinkedIn, pretty much there everywhere on the interwebs. So yeah, thank you for attending this talk. Thank you for attending Product Schools webinar. Uh, hope to get in touch with you. Bye-bye.